Neville Goddard, June 6, 1969 A Parabolic Revelation It is in you as a person that the nature of God is revealed. For a scriptural episode is not a record of a historical event, but a parabolic revelation of truth. To see Jesus, or David, as a historical character is to see truth tempered to the weakness of your soul. You must see what the characters represent rather than the characters themselves. This is true for every story in scripture, for every episode will unfold within you. The title of the 54th Psalm is translated as, David is hiding with us in the King James Version, and David is in hiding among us in the Revised Standard Version. But the title should read, David is in hiding within us, for that is where he is, as well as every character in scripture. When I say, with Blake, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow, I mean that literally, for the drama of life unfolds from within. The characters Jesus, David, Abraham, and Moses are but personifications of eternal states which you individually will encounter as you move towards the ultimate awakening of being God himself. In his poem, Saul, Robert Browning tells the story recorded in the 16th chapter of the book of 1 Samuel of how David cured Saul of the evil spirits which the Lord had sent upon him. Do not see Saul as a man, but as humanity. He is the human being referred to in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. And the great watcher said, Hew down the tree, cut off its branches, scatter its leaves and its fruits, but leave the stump. Then the tree became personified as, Let him be watered with the dew from heaven, and let him move with the beasts of the earth. Take from him the mind of man, and give him the mind of a beast. Let seven times pass over him, until he knows that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to him who he will, even the lowliest of men. Saul personifies the mind of the beast, for Saul went insane. He was violent and could not remember who he was. Then David appears and cures him of his insanity by telling him of the coming of the Messiah, saying, O Saul, it shall be a face like my face that receives thee, a man like to me. Thou shalt love and be loved by forever, a hand like this hand. Shall throw open the gates of a new life to thee, See the Christ stand. You may think this is an episode in the pages of history, but it is a drama which will take place in you. As an insane being who is looking for an external savior, one day you will encounter David, he who never walked the face of the earth, and save yourself. All revelations have the mode of certainty above about them. When David stands before you, you who were insane only a moment before, having forgotten who you are, will remember. Then, as Saul, you will see the true relationship between you and your son, and the revelation as to who you really are. Then, you who were formerly Saul will become Paul, and say, Henceforth I regard no one from the human point of view, even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view. I regard him thus no longer. Paul was trained to believe in an external historical part past of Israel. To him, David was the king of kings. But when God revealed his son in him, Paul claimed he did not see anyone as flesh and blood. What man, believing in the historicity of scripture, could understand what Paul was talking about, when he was the one who formally tormented anyone who would not accept the historicity of the Old Testament? But when discussing the Messiah, Paul confessed that he could no longer believe in any historical character of the Old Testament. The New, of course, had not yet been written. Through Revelation, Paul knew who the Messiah was and who the Lord was. Seeing himself as the Lord, the one the world believes to be Jesus, Paul knew that what the world believed to be a mighty king was his only begotten son who was never flesh and blood. He knew the entire episode took place in the spirit and said, 
when it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, I discussed it not with flesh and blood. To see Jesus, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, or any of the characters of Scripture as men of flesh and blood and external to yourself in the pages of history is to see truth tempered to the weakness of your soul, because until the revelation takes place, you are unable to stand the force of the light of revelation. There is nothing more difficult than to give up a fixed idea, especially concerning religion or politics. Born into a certain religious group, your mother taught you what she was taught by her mother. The school and church you attend confirms your mother's words, and you believe that the characters of Scripture lived in time and space and left behind a record of their physical existence, when it isn't so at all. These are all revelations of an eternal drama which is in you, for your true being is your own wonderful human imagination. Many times I have been asked if I believe there once was a man called Jesus, and I always answer, no. I did believe it, but I no longer believe in the historicity of any character of scripture, for I encounter them as personified states. I have entered the final state, which is Jesus, and in that state it was revealed to me that I am Jesus and Christ is my son. Christ, my creative power and wisdom, is the one who was anointed with the oil of gladness and called David. It was in the spirit that David called Jesus, Father. He does not do this in flesh, for if you take the events chronologically, you will see that they are separated in time by 1,000 years, and I tell you the story is contemporary. It is not something of the past. The Lord Jesus is with you now at this very moment, for he is your very being, your reality. We are told that he is a father in the 17th chapter of John as, Holy Father, keep them in thy name that thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. The Father-Son is an inner action relationship. At one moment the Son is speaking, and the next moment it is the Father who speaks. Then without warning he jumps back to that of the Son, and man is confused. Man thinks of one being of flesh and blood when it is an inner relationship of father-son. I received a letter this week from a lady who is here tonight. In a vision, she saw a man and his son sitting at a table. At that moment, she knew she was the son and the father and that they were one. Now, this same lady had another vision in which a friend proclaimed to the crowd in a very loud voice that the lady was pregnant and bringing forth the son of God. She is right. For this lady is bringing forth the Son of God, as she is God. This Son will be born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. She is the Jesus of Scripture, bringing forth God, and because God is a Father, his last gift to her is himself. If God is the Father and he gives you himself, he gives you his Son to reveal it. So he sends the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Father. And if God's Son calls you Father, then you must be God. And if God the Father is the Lord Jesus and Christ is his anointed one, then your Son is David, for he is the one the Lord anointed and proclaimed, Thou art my Son, today I have begotten thee. This comes as a great shock to those who are raised in the Christian and Jewish faith, for there is no, one, no more historicity in the characters of the Old Testament than there is in the New. Every character represents an eternal state through which you, an individual, must pass in your journey from darkness to light. And when you come to the journey's end, you move into the state personified as God the Father. David is in hiding within us. This we are told by the Ziphites of the tribe of Judah. If you read scripture correctly, you will see that the only son of Jacob mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus is Judah. This brings us to Saul, who was notified that David was hiding within him. As an insane man, Saul could not understand. If David is hiding within me, where do I look for him? But wait, David will come out. I know, at one moment in time, there will be an explosion within you, which will release David, who is hiding in you, for we are all the insane of Daniel. Look at the world today and ask yourself, if we aren't all insane, when we murder each other and cheat one another, when there really is no other. 
The prayer is that they be one as we are one. That is because they do not realize we are all be one being. Nothing can bring you to this realization other than the revelation of the Son to the Father. I know so many of you are bringing forth the Son of God. Another lady in this audience tonight wrote saying she was sleeping at the home of a friend when she sees a baby boy, devoid of clothes, lying on a blanket. As she picks it up, she hears the doorbell ring. Answering the door with the child in her arms, she sees her daughter, who says, Mother, put some clothes on your baby because I have brought a friend. As they enter the house, the friend pats the baby on the back and says, What a beautiful child. She returns to the room as she covers the baby with a blanket, the swaddling cloth. She awakens. This is a wonderful adumbration forecasting the real events recorded in scripture. Then she will know the truth concerning the birth of God. Another lady saw the child as her sister's boy. Holding it close, she looked into its face, which turned into that of a cherub, who smiled at her. Then she knew she could not give the child up as it was hers. This too is an adumbration. All of these are foreshadowing. These ladies are all mothers with children of their own. The last lady has five children, yet the child of their vision is spiritual. For the whole Bible from beginning to end is a supernatural document and not a historical fact as man has been led to believe. If you see Jesus as a historical character, it is because you do not have the courage to face the brilliant light of the revelation of truth. I know when it came to me, everything within me fell. We are told that in the end, all of the buildings will fall. These buildings are the structures of the mind by which we live. The belief in the historicity of Jesus is a building. The belief in the historicity of the Bible is a building. Externalized as churches and cathedrals, they are beautiful, but they will all fall within you in your last days. And from their ashes, that which is permanent will rise. For from then on, you will not live by an external belief. You will know that everything unfolds from within. The story is told that Judas would go into a garden and give a sign designating the one who holds the secret. The sign was a kiss. You will find this story in the 14th chapter of the book of Mark. When you read it, you may think this is an episode which took place in some historical past, but it is not. It is something you will experience. Then you will discover that the drama is contemporaneous. It is with us now, for I have had that experience. I am teaching the word of God from experience, therefore I am the word that went out. I sent it out from myself by clothing myself in flesh, for the word became flesh and dwells within. When all that the word implies unfolded in me, I told my experience to a group of twelve men, and when one departed I knew he was going to reveal my teaching. Then a handsome, wonderful man entered to fulfill the fourteenth chapter of Mark. This is the sign I give you. The one I shall kiss is the man. Treat him kindly, but do not let him go. If this is the truth, don't let go, for it is the truth I am going to kiss. Approaching me, the man extends his arms in adoration, embraces me, and kisses me on the left side of my neck. Now the word Judah means to praise with extended arms. It was Judah who embraced and kissed me. He served my sleeve, revealing the arm of the Lord, thus fulfilling scripture. And who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm is the symbol of the creative power of God. That is what was revealed in its beautiful imagery. Here was a handsome man, about forty, gloriously dressed, fulfilling everything scripture said he would do when he comes. Believe my words, for they are true. Let everything you formal, formally believed in go but do not let the word of truth go. I know it is difficult to give up the belief in the historicity of scripture. When I first came to Los Angeles, it was back in 1945. At the time, I was invited by a very prominent man in the metaphysical field to conduct a series of lectures on the Bible. The night I arrived, I was to address 400 to 500 of his graduates. About five minutes before I took the platform, the man took me aside and told me that I could not speak on the non-historicity of the Bible because he teaches the Bible as history and did not want his people disturbed. I thanked him, told him that because I was his guest, I would abide by his decision this night, but in the future he could not tell me what to say. 
Then I reminded him of the scripture, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. I can only speak of what I have seen and heard. I know the Bible is not histor historically true, but is eternally true. The records recorded there are forever and to be experienced by all. Scripture is a revelation of truth which carries with it such certainty it cannot be denied. Having heard the truth from someone who has experienced it, you may feel my message is too much to grasp. But when it happens in you, doubt leaves, for you know the truth from experience. Every story is true, but not as recorded. They were not writing secular history, but divine or sacral history, which is forever. It is not something that happened in the past or that will come. The climax has been reached and is always being reached every moment in time. The Jesus of Scripture is seated here tonight, and his Son, bearing witness to his fatherhood, is hiding in you. In the 54th Psalm, Saul was told that David was hiding within, just as I am telling you now. David is hiding in you and will come out when an explosion takes place within you. And when you see David, he will be standing. That is why I believe Browning had the experience, because the symbolism he used is perfect. See the Christ stand. When I saw David, I was seated, but he was standing. The word Christ means the Messiah. Standing before Saul, David tells of the coming of the Messiah, saying, His face will be like my face. He will be a man like me. You are going to love the Messiah, and he will love you forever. This relationship between you and David is one of infinite love, and it is forever. Here David is telling Saul that he is the Messiah, for he is the Christ, the anointed of the Lord. Then he said, A hand just like this hand will open the door of a new life to you. And standing before him, he says, See the Christ stand. But Saul could not understand. Those who read Browning missed the point because it is in conflict with their fixed ideas concerning Jesus. They think he is the Christ, but I tell you, Jesus is God the Father whose final revelation to man is the gift of himself. God gives himself to you by sending his Son into your heart, crying, Father, thus revealing your true identity. Until then, you do not know that you are Jesus and remain confused by the hearing of many different beliefs. I speak of this only from the platform where you come to hear it, but I would never go into your home and volunteer this information. That would be silly and completely out of order. I would be taking my pearls and throwing them before those who are not yet qualified to receive them, so I do not disturb them. But you who know it are called upon to voice what you know, and you who are moved to teach, teach the true words of the pattern which I have given you, but do not change the pattern. Paul called the pattern my gospel. Paul was, the, Paul was very proud of the fact that he was born a Jew, saying, I was born of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Then the whole thing unfolded within him, and he realized the non-historicity of his own great book, yet its truth. He recognized the characters recorded there as eternal state through which every individual must pass. One day you will experience the state of Abraham and know what faith really is. When you see that giant of a man leaning against a tree, you will see a serpent wound around its trunk. The serpent will have a human face with the wisest expression. In Genesis, the serpent is recorded as the wisest of all God's creatures. And you will see Abraham's eyes looking into time as recorded in the book of Galatians. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify all by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So before the events took place, Abraham was shown the end, and when you look at him, his attention is focused, not on the distance of space, but of time. And the tree under which he stands looks like the human brain. When you see Abraham, you will know you are seeing the beginning of the journey. Wisdom is present in the form of a serpent, and faith is present in the form of Abraham. His name is changed from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means father of the multitude. The change occurred when the letter he was added. This letter carries the symbol of grace. So grace was put into the name to indicate that God had given himself to his creation, the work of his hand. Putting the gift of grace into the name of the father of the multitudes, the journey begins. 
So when you read scripture, try to bear in mind that you are reading about infinite states of consciousness, which are eternal. Remember, you are Jesus. And when you find the Christ, you have found the Lord's anointed, who is David. You will know him, for he will come to you in the spirit and call you father. How then can you be his son? Because the words father, son are interchangeable. I and my father are one. He who sees me, the son, sees the father. Always keep this in mind when reading scripture. If you will accept what I have told you this night, life will be much easier for you. Knowing this truth, you can't pass the buck anymore. But knowing you are the Lord, you can do anything because you are all imagination and imagining creates reality. You can imagine anything and sustain it with faith. As you walk in the faith that which you have imagined it is so, it will become so. This I know from experience. Back in 1943, when I came out of the army, I was looking for an apartment. My wife and I had determined how much we were going to pay for it, but when we found the apartment, the rent was more than we had planned to pay. Realizing this, my wife said, Well, that's not demonstrating this principle, is it? I said nothing. I simply paid the months of September and October, but when I went to pay the November rent, the manager said, I have an apology to make to you. An authority of the city came in and looked over my books. He discovered that the apartment you have was formerly rented for less. Then he quoted the new rent figure to me, which was to the dollar amount that I had originally chosen to pay. It took me three months of being faithful to what I had imagined I was paying, even though during that time I was paying more. But since the reduced rent was re retroactive to the day I moved in, I got it all back at the beginning of the third month. I committed myself in my imagination to what I was going to pay. I went looking, and because I was going to pay more, in his eyes, he gave me all kinds of concessions he would not have done had I paid him what the former tenant did. First of all, he allowed us to pick out the wallpaper, the colors, and rooms he wanted, we wanted painted. He even built a bookshelf for me which covered an entire wall for all my books. He did everything I wanted, but if I had gone in there and gotten the rent for the amount I said I would pay, he would not have built the bookcase for me, given me the wallpaper, or painted the entire apartment for my specifications. Only then was the rent reduced to the amount I had imagined it to be, and we, we remained there for almost 14 years. I tell you, imagination will not fail you if you are faithful. What could I say when I was confronted with the negation of my assumption? Nothing. I simply would not give up, and when the time was right, my assumption became a fact. I urge you to set your goal high. Assume the feeling it has been reached and sleep in that feeling. Persist and I promise you that not one thing in this world can rob you of that which you have assumed. But the most important thing is to know that which is housed within you is God's plan of redemption and he only redeems himself. God came down into the world and housed himself in you. Now he is going to discover who he is for it is in you as a person that the nature of God is revealed. Now let us go into the silence.